and welcome back to my channel. If you're new, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the horrific torture and murder of a totally innocent young woman. But before we get started, I just want to remind you that if you have been watching my videos and enjoying them, I would really, really appreciate it if you could subscribe. That would really help me out a lot. Thank you in advance if you do, and thank you if you already have. This story is actually going to be a two-parter, so definitely make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the second part, which should be out in a few days. So today we're going to be talking about a young woman named Piang Nai Don. Piang was born on June 13th, 1992 in Chin State in Myanmar. Myanmar is a country in Southeast Asia. It's a former British colony. And actually throughout history, there have been many different names for it. Uh, another common name for it is Burma. It looks like Myanmar, if you're American, but it's actually pronounced Myanmar. The R at the end makes sense in British English, since it is a former British colony. Um, in British English, you wouldn't pronounce the R. If you are interested in the very esoteric topic of names of Myanmar, there is a very long Wikipedia article with that same title that you can check out. Myanmar is home to between 51 and 55 million people. It's one of the most ethnically diverse countries in the world. It has 135 recognized ethnic groups and seven ethnic minority states. Unfortunately, there are a lot of downsides to this because there ends up being a lot of inter-ethnic conflict in Myanmar. There's basically constant conflict among the ethnic groups, especially between the Burmese military, which are the Tatmada, and some of the specific ethnic groups. Because the country's people don't have that much of a national identity, it basically means they're just mired in infighting all the time. So actually, the world's longest civil war is still going on in Myanmar. It's been going on for over 70 years. So Piang was from Chen State, which is a mountainous region on the border with India and Bangladesh. It's one of the poorest areas in Myanmar with a poverty rate of 73%. Piang was raised Catholic, and her village, Dempi Village, only has about 1,500 people. Piang had 10 siblings, and their parents were farmers. But when Piang was about four years old, both of her parents died within a year of each other. That was around 1997. And sadly, five of her siblings had died by 2016. I don't know how the parents and siblings all died, I was trying to Google it to try to figure out and do some research about what could have happened, like what was going on there at the time. Myanmar in general does not have the best medical care, and diseases that are easily treated in the rich world, like malaria and pneumonia, are very common causes of death there. There's really not even medicine a lot of the time, and hospitals and doctors are really far away. For example, in Dempi Village, you'd have to travel two hours away to see a doctor. And on top of that, during the monsoon season, a lot of the roads are washed out, and so it could even be impossible or almost impossible to go see a doctor. While I was researching this, I found this really interesting study about the connection between health problems and human rights abuses. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that since I found it and I thought it was really interesting. In Chen State, 92% of households indicated that at least one family member had been subjected to forced labor in the last year. The study was from 2011, by the way. 43% of households faced moderate to severe hunger. And common violations reported were food theft, livestock theft or killing, forced displacement, beatings and torture, detentions, disappearances, and religious and ethnic persecution. So all that is to say that life for most people in Chen State is not easy. P. 
Piang quit school in the ninth grade and she went on to become a construction worker. While she was doing this, she actually got a boyfriend and got pregnant, but he left her and her son was born in February 2013. And let me just say, I can't imagine what poor Piang was going through at this time because she'd already lost her parents, five of her siblings, and now she's been abandoned by her lover. That's a lot of abandonment in her life. And she was very young. She was 21 when she had her son. In the spring of 2015, Piang was approached by a recruiter who was looking for domestic helpers, who are sometimes referred to as maids, to go work in Singapore. Some of her neighbors had told her that wages in Singapore were much higher than what she could get in Myanmar. And thinking about her baby son and how she needed to support him, she actually agreed to go to Singapore to become a domestic helper. Her plan was to buy a plot of land and build a house in a place called Kalei Township. I think that's a little bit of a bigger city that's in Chen State. Now, one thing about this was that Piang actually wasn't quite old enough, technically, to be able to go to Singapore to become a domestic helper. She was just 22 at the time, and you had to be 23. So the recruiter actually bribed a passport official in Myanmar and got her birth date changed from June 13th to April 13th, 1992. So it looked like she had just turned 23. Piang left her baby son with her older sister and was off to Singapore in May 2015. So if you didn't know, Singapore is a city-state on the tip of the Malay Peninsula. It's right next to Malaysia, and it's also really close to Indonesia. It became a British colony in 1819 and was under British control until 1959, with the exception of a few years during World War II when Japan actually took control of Singapore. Singapore is a very advanced economy. It's a financial center and tech hub. It's one of the top four GDPs. It has almost 5.7 million people, and it is pretty expensive there. But a lot of people who live there can afford to have domestic help. In fact, about 20% of households actually have a domestic helper. These domestic helpers are often referred to as maids. I'm not going to refer to them as maids, because the word maid comes from maid servant, which literally means this person is your servant, and that's not how this relationship should be. The domestic helper is an employee and has their own rights. Traditionally, they came from the Philippines or Indonesia, but domestic helpers started being brought in from Myanmar at some point, and they're actually paid less than the domestic helpers from the Philippines or Indonesia. At least at the time that this happened, there was no minimum wage for them. I read that they got paid a minimum of $350 to $400 a month, but I'm not sure how accurate that is. Now, as you can imagine, bringing in someone from a less fortunate country into your home to help you with chores sounds a bit problematic in the first place. So language issues are very common for these domestic helpers. They can't always understand what their employers are trying to tell them, and they can't always communicate what they want to say to them. And apparently it's also common for there to be a lack of efficiency in cooking and cleaning. And if you think about it, that makes sense. I mean, if you're just used to cleaning your own house or cooking for yourself, you're probably just going to take your time doing it because it's not a big deal to get it done quickly if it's just you. I mean, that's how I am anyway. So traditionally, these domestic helpers go and live with the family. And you can imagine that sometimes, in some cases, this could be totally overwhelming. You're in a new country with a new language, new food, new people that you're working for, totally new expectations. Frankly, it sounds like a bit of a recipe for misery, but I know that it has worked out well in some cases. So when Piang got to Singapore, the recruitment agency set her up with her employer, and her employer was a woman named Gayathri Murugayan. 
who was 35 years old. She was a homemaker. She was married to 37-year-old Kevin Chelvum, and they lived with their two children and Gayathri's mother, whose name was Prima. Prima was 57 years old. Gayathri and Kevin's daughter was four years old at the time in 2015, and they had a son who was just a baby. On top of that, there were also two Chinese tenants living in their flat. Now, Piang was the fifth domestic helper to go live with Gayathri and her family and be their helper. And I'm not sure what the circumstances were for why the other four domestic helpers left, but I find that a little bit strange. So in this situation, the employer is allowed to assert a lot of rules on the helper. So one of Gayathri's many rules, which we're going to get to, was that poor Piang was not allowed to have a cell phone. So on top of all these other things I've mentioned, now Piang can't even contact her family. She can't text other domestic helpers that she meets in Singapore, maybe if they want to go out or have dinner or something. She has no way to communicate with anyone. Also, helpers are supposed to get a day off every week, but they were allowed to trade that day off for compensation. And so that's what Piang ended up doing with Gayathri. So she literally had no days off. Gayathri was verbally abusive to Piang from the very beginning. She would yell at her and just be totally inappropriate with her. She said that Piang was unhygienic, slow, and ate too much. Like I said, she had all of these rules, and if Piang broke any of the rules, she would yell at her. So, for example, Piang was only allowed to sleep five hours a night. She was only given bread soaked in water to eat, or a little bit of rice at night. Oh yeah, sometimes they let her eat a little bit of cold food straight from the fridge. Gayathri made her wear multiple layers of face masks because she felt she was so unhygienic. And also, Gayathri would not even let Piang use the bathroom with the door closed. She had to leave the door open. Five months after Piang started working for Gayathri, her verbal abuse turned physical, and Gayathri started straight up assaulting Piang in October 2015. She would pour cold water on Piang, kick her, punch her, stomp on her, push her. She would hit her with objects like a metal ladle and plastic bottles. She would even lift Piang up by her hair and pull chunks of hair out of her head. Gayathri also shook Piang like a rag doll by her hair. And if that wasn't enough, Gayathri also burned Piang's arm with an iron, and started choking her. By the way, obviously none of this is okay ever, but I just want to say that if somebody is trying to choke you, you need to get away from that person right then. I've read that if somebody acts like they're going to choke you, there is a much, much higher chance that they will actually kill you. So please keep that in mind. Gayathri was doing all of this right in front of her children. Her little baby son, in some cases, was playing just a few feet away from where Gayathri was totally terrorizing Piang. In case you were thinking, from the way I described it, that it was just Gayathri doing this to Piang, well, you'd actually be wrong. Because Gayathri's mother, Prima, was doing all of the same things. And you might also be thinking, I guess this is going on during the day while the husband is at work, right? Well, not exactly. Gayathri's husband, Kevin, was a police officer, and he actually participated in this abuse, too. All three of these adults were physically abusing Piang, this tiny little young woman who was just trying to make something for herself in life. And if you're wondering how we know all of these details, well... It's not because someone confessed. It's not because it was written in a journal. It didn't come from Prima or Kevin admitting it to the police. It was all caught 
on CCTV, which I will get to later. Now, domestic helpers in Singapore are supposed to have medical checkups, and Gayathri did take Piang to the doctor twice. She took her once when she had been with them for six months, which would have been around November 2015, and once when she had been with them for 10 months, which would have been around March 2016. Of course, Gayathri would not allow Piang to speak for herself or ask any questions of the doctor. Gayathri spoke for Piang the whole time, and the doctor noticed that Piang had a lot of scarring and bruises around her eye sockets and her cheeks. But Gayathri just said that Piang was clumsy, and she fell down a lot, and that's why she had horrible bruising all over her face. Piang's employment agency actually did talk to her twice, but she didn't mention anything about this abuse, and I'm not sure if that was because she was just kind of embarrassed, or if she felt like she just didn't have the strength to bring it up, or if it was because she was stuck in Gayathri's apartment with Gayathri listening to her all the time. There's a government agency in Singapore called the Ministry of Manpower, and it's also known as MOM. And they are supposed to set up rules and regulations about how domestic helpers should be treated. Well, Gayathri's husband, Kevin, would call mom and complain about Piang. And the agency would offer to replace her, but he kept saying, no thanks. Even though she didn't have a phone, Piang was somehow able to contact her family five times. She called them five times during the tenure of her employment with Gayathri. She never mentioned the abuse to her family, but during her last call, which was on July 12th, 2016, she did mention that she wanted to come home because she wasn't feeling well. This struck her family as really strange because, first of all, if you need medical care, Singapore is a great place to get it. And secondly, if Piang had tried to come home during that time, it would have been really difficult because it was the monsoon season, and so a lot of the roads were washed out. She would have had to take three planes and a bus to get home, and there was no guarantee that she would have gotten home anyway. The last part of the journey would have taken multiple days. Piang's family had no idea that this would actually be the last time that they would ever talk to her. This is just so horrible, but right after this phone call... Gayathri started tying Piang to the window grill, so like the little metal bars protecting the window, and making her sleep on the kitchen floor while she was tied up. This went on for what would be the last 12 days of Piang's life. On the night of July 25th, 2016, Gayathri and Prima tied Piang up to the window grill and accused Piang of stealing food from the fridge. And by the way, I forgot to mention that Gayathri was also starving Piang. I know I mentioned what she was allowed to eat, but Piang had lost a lot of weight. She was absolutely skin and bones by this point. So Gayathri had her tied up. She was accusing Piang of having stolen food, and Prima and Gayathri started pouring cold water on Piang, she actually begged them for mercy. She begged them to stop. But they wouldn't. The next morning, which was July 26, 2016, Gayathri woke up at 5 a.m. and immediately went to the kitchen and started kicking Piang and stomping on her head and neck. She grabbed Piang by the hair and pulled her head backwards as far as it would go twice. She also started choking her, but then Gayathri noticed that Piang actually wasn't responding anymore to her torture. Gayathri supposedly thought that Piang just didn't want to wake up. And so apparently she just left her there for two and a half hours. And around 7.30, Kevin left for work. And Gayathri and Prima tried to get Piang to wake up, but they couldn't get her to wake up. Two hours later... Prima finally suggests that maybe Gayathri should call Piang's doctor. Gee, great idea. So Gayathri called, she spoke to a nurse, and said that she had just found Piang on the floor. 
no idea what happened, didn't do anything wrong, just it so happened that Piang was found unconscious on the kitchen floor. The nurse offered to send an ambulance right away, but Gayathri said no. She wanted a doctor to come over and examine Piang in the house. So the nurse agreed to send Piang's doctor, and right after they hung up, Gayathri and Prima quickly took Piang's wet clothes, which they had made wet by pouring cold water on her, and changed her into some dry clothes. Dr. Grace Kwan arrived to the apartment at 10.50 a.m. and told Gayathri and Prima that Piang was dead. Both of them acted shocked, and they lied and said that she had just been moving moments before Dr. Kwan got there. Dr. Kwan called an ambulance, and they arrived 40 minutes later and pronounced Piang deceased. She was just 24 years old. Piang's cause of death was found to be hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Basically, Gayathri had choked her so much that it cut off oxygen to her brain. During the autopsy, they found that Piang had 31 recent scars and 47 external injuries. Plus, like I said earlier, Piang had been starved so much that she lost 38% of her body weight, which is insane. She was already tiny to begin with. I mean, she was barely alive while Gayathri was torturing her and eventually killed her. Piang weighed only 53 pounds. I just cannot even imagine 53 pounds for an adult woman. And that's where I'm going to leave the story for now. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the second part. As always, thank you so much for watching. I will be back in a few days with part two of Piang's story.